Good afternoon, everybody. Here we are at the uh, Percy Baxter Theatre. Uh, we're here with uh, Gargan Sharma and Simon Salinas uh, from Uni Melbourne. Uh, they've been working with Linux since 2006 and active technology enthusiasts. And uh, today we'll be talking about open source technologies in neuroscience. Thank you. Thank you. So you can hear me well and clear. Is that okay? Okay. I know I'm competing with the Facebook, Twitter, and your email, so I just want to make sure that you can hear us. All right. Uh, every presentation is motivated by someone, and so does this. Uh, last year, 2015, I was sitting next to our ex-Linux Australia president, Josh, and uh, at the Penguin dinner, as a part of our conversation, I was telling him about our work and how Linux is helpful in this process. And his reply was that, hey, you should present your work to the wider Linux community. And with his words and Linux Australia's help, today we feel pride in presenting our work. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gagan Sharma, and my background is in computer science and management. I've been working in the field of neuroscience from last couple of years. And today, here I'm with my colleague, Simon Salinas, who is a mechanical engineer, but much more neuroscientist now. We will show you today some practical example, no sophisticated code here, but before I get started, I need to tell you, I will begin by telling you that what kind of work we do. This is us at the Brain Imaging Lab. We constantly receive images from the local scanners and sites around the world. We process this data to enhance its value, and we output pretty pictures, which could be useful for the high quality publication and for the clinical translation. We will start telling you uh, why Linux can be a steep learning curve uh, worth learning, particularly for someone like me. Then we will show you how open source technologies help in clinical trials. We will present a couple of neat open source tools for image processing. We will briefly present a few examples from other neuroscience projects. And we will conclude by showing you how Linux is fundamental for our workflow. We're not uh, natural born programmers like many of you, but rather somewhat tech savvy people. So uh, we'd like to tell you briefly about our story with Linux and uh, why it is a steep learning curve worth learning. I say steep learning curve because um, I was indoctrinated in Windows operating systems uh, during uni and high school. And uh, the first thing I saw when I started working in this field was a lot of black terminal windows that looked like the matrix spaceship. And that can be quite scary for someone that only knows how to double click and navigate with icons. So again, I'm not a programmer and Linux was not my friend when I started. But with time I became comfortable with MATLAB and bash scripting. And I noticed Gagan was coming back from this type of conferences very excited. So I asked him, well, why bother traveling so much when information is abundant these days and you can pretty much learn everything on Google? And he laughed and forced me to join him to the next uh, conference. So I started coming along to Python conferences. And then I understood there's uh, something you cannot absorb by Googling everything on an isolated corner. In short, these conferences provide an atmosphere for networking and learning about new tools. And this is what motivated us to start using uh, Linux ecosystems more in our work. One of the major components of our work is to manage and support the medical imaging post-processing in the stroke-based clinical trials. As you can see on the screen, there's a picture where there's a clot which blocks the blood flow to the area of the brain, and the black thing is showing this part of the brain is dying. So doctors have to give either some drug or they have to take the clot out so that they can make the blood flow normal, which is being represented by that little animation where you can see that there is a clot in the brain, they put the wire in and they take the clot out. And once they take the clot out, the blood flow starts becoming normal. But there are some inherent challenges to this trial. And first is the finding the patients. And the next is the process of recruitment, which is very tedious. Once you get the process right, then you have to replicate that process over all the collaborating centers. Last but not the least, technology. And that's where Linux comes in and makes our life uh, easy. Now I'm going to show you the medical imaging post-processing workflow in our clinical trials. So when we get a patient, we scan the patient. 
The data is being reviewed and then it is processed to a small computer, which we call at Linux Imaging Server. And this is automatic processing. Once the processing finished, it produces a colored image, which is just on your screen, and then that image is being pushed to the hospital pack system, which we call that picture archiving system. This email is also uh, sent to the doctors who are off-site via the email. Now you must be wondering that what this colored image means. So on the screen, if you can see that, the pink color means that this part of the brain has died. And the green means that this is at the danger and it could be saved if given the right therapy. And patient is lucky also. But you must be thinking what Linux has to do with it. But I will try to convince you in the next few minutes that this could not happen without Linux. Sometimes in life, we are all well dictated by the financial circumstances and research is not different. But in this case, Linux provides us with a very optimal solution. The software was developed on Linux, which provides doctors with a very critical information about the brain and how the blood is flowing in the brain, so that they can make a right decision to save someone from the death or from a major disability. It runs rock solid on Linux in a very harsh environment. When I say harsh, because these are small boxes which are not sitting in server room or in some aircon room. They are sitting underneath someone's table where there is a lot of human movement, a lot of dust. So that's why I call it harsh. And they're running 24 into seven with the minimal hardware cost, somewhere around 600 to $800 for the small form factor machine with a three years on-site warranty next day. So with this all whole thing, reduce the software cost and maintenance from our budget. And then we were able to replicate this process over 35 sites around the world in a physical or virtual way, whichever it was possible. I'm pretty sure that now you can visualize the impact of Linux on our project, which was 35 sites running 24 into 7, processing software provided to us by the Stanford University for our research, via our research collaboration, no operating system cost, and the whole infrastructure being managed by the research team. I love this line from Zeno Python. Simple, not complex things make a big difference in life. And this applies, to, this applies as well to our philosophy since we try to use simple tools to deliver the neat and powerful solution. Here's a quick example of how we use simple Python code to deliver a centralized report telling us if any of our machines are down, close to full capacity, or failing to connect to hospital servers. But to make it even simpler and boil it down to basic <coughs> Linux tool, we'd like to ask you the following question. Yesterday, I ran into Andrew Tijel, the father of rsync command. And I said, hey, do you know that your rsync is saving people? And he just giggled and laughed out. But I would like to ask you the question that do you think the, these simple things, rsync, SCP, SSH, or CronTab, could actually help patient in the clinic? How many of you can even dream of? OK, that's fine. Uh, we will try to convince you with this particular example from our day-to-day -day work. So there was a situation at work. One of our participating sites had some issues with their email server. And they could not provide us with the capability to send an email to the doctors who were off-site but were involved in our project. As I explained earlier, this particular uh, image is a vital piece of information needed by the doctors before they can make an informed decision. To solve the problem, we wrote a script via the cron tab to rsync those images to our server and then send an email to doctor. Simple, no fancy things, but helping patients. I'm not exaggerating here, but imagine if you can send, you know, if you can send a doctor the required information on time, he or she could be consulted on time and they can give their valuable treatment advice on time, it may change someone's life. And this is the power of Linux, which we realize in our workflow. Furthermore, these super efficient tools are helping us in our site maintenance, in the technical resolution, in our day-to-day -day housekeeping, and also for our data transfer, which is the core part of our collaboration work. There are so many examples from our daily work where without Linux, we would um, be stuck or almost unable to support our workflow. Uh, here's another example of a real-time emergency where Linux ecosystem saved the day. Um, when the patient moves inside the scanner, the output images are not suitable for diagnosis. Look at this video for a moment and tell me if you could see someone, something unusual. Um, this uh, sudden hiccup 
um, happens when the patient moves inside the scanner. And this is represented uh, on the diagnostic image as a green area that is overestimated and hence provides um, false information to the doctor. So to fix this, we have to manually delete the motion affected slices or tell the site which slices to delete if they have the capacity to do so. Then we send the images back to the stroke software, usually within five minutes so that suitable maps can be generated for clinical diagnosis. The point here is that even with challenging situations like this, um, when the software is unable to deal with motion errors, the speed and reliability of Linux uh, helps us find ways around to generate a suitable output. Another important component of our work is to manage the data for this image processing. But before I start talking about that, I would like to tell you that what sort of image we work with. We call that imaging a uh, DICOM image. I'm pretty sure some of you may already know about this DICOM imaging. It's the language of the medical imaging equipment, which has two parts. One is the header and other is the image itself. Well, DICOM itself in itself is a Pandora box and I'm not gonna go to it because it can take our whole presentation. But to tell you that uh, for medical data management, we are using our snapshots. I'm pretty sure you all are using it. It's simple, it's easy to use, and if something happens, people know how to get the backup back if I'm not there or Simon is not there. But more importantly, the DCMTK toolkit, which is available on Linux, this is a core part of our work. Because when we receive a data, sometimes it consists of a couple of thousand of files and we don't know to which patient it belongs. We need to sort it in some systematic way so that we can visualize it properly and for the better navigation. And that's where DCM DCMTK Toolkit comes in. And Simon will tell you how this toolkit helps us and makes our life easy in our everyday work. That's right. Uh, DCMTK is part of our Swiss Army knife. Very quick and handy. This open source tool motivated us to develop Python code which we presented earlier this year in PyCon. And we use uh, this tool to access headers which are important for our processing. Um, let me show you how this is helpful in our work. So I'm going to a terminal window and I'm inside a folder that has a lot of DICOM files. What I'm going to do is I will assign uh, one of these files to a variable called file. and now I can use uh, DCM dump to access all of the headers in that file. And you can easily filter as well, for example, for patient name. Here you see the patient name. Or, for example, uh, study date. And here you have quick access to those headers. Just to add to this point that these headers have a lot of vital information which is sometimes required for the quality check and for other purposes. And these small command line tools which we can script it or we can use it in our programming, uh, this makes our work, you know, to the delivery easy. Again, simple commands that can help you access those headers over SSH. That's very handy when dealing with emergencies on remote servers. Another example is uh, data transfer. Again, just a few lines, um, and I will show this example on another terminal window. I'm in my home area, and I will make a folder called test folder. Now I will enter this folder. It's empty, as you can see. And I will start a listening port with the help of um, store SCP. I have assigned it to this number. And now I can go to the window where I have all of my files and I can push them with a store CU command and this is what happens. Now you see the all of the images have arrived into that folder. Now this is just an example which we are looping in the local host, but you can imagine if we have a connections between our sites and the data transfer can happen over the network, it's very secure, and we can sort this data on the fly. It takes a lot of work, labor work out of our routines because we don't want to change the DVDs or CDs uh, to get the data on the computers. 
Uh, Linux also helps us to develop handy data viewers that can be easily fired from the command line. And again, this started with a challenge at work, which Gagan will tell you about. So at some stage at work, we were, we were given an opportunity to develop a 3D data viewer so that we can review some data set. And also, we were needing that sort of a toolkit which we could fire over the SSH uh, to visualize our data, which is at some at one of our sites, participating sites, somewhere in the world. And these sort of reinventing the wheel sometimes helps you a lot because the kind of viewers which were avail available in the market was not helping us for this situation. So we developed this 3D data viewer which could read the DICOM and all the image format. It could be used easily as a module in our simple bash or Python programming. And it was very quick to load, easy to change the contrast levels, but Simon will show you uh, on, the, on the terminal window. But before that, you, must be, you, must, you will laugh if I tell you that how many lines of code I wrote for this 3D data view. I mean, I only wrote 14 lines of code to get a 3D data view, and thanks to the open source community, when you have, somebody has done all the hard work and you take a leverage of your work by injecting your small code into the code and you get a 3D data view running in no time. As you can see on your screen, this is not written by me, PyQt graphic example. I got this code, I injected this with 14 lines of my code, and we got a 3D data view running in no time. How good is that? So let's have a look at the 3D data viewer itself. That's fine. There you go. So as you can see, there are uh, two windows. How responsive this 3D data viewer is that you can easily change the contrast level. And in the middle of these two windows, there is the axis which helps you to go through the slices. And the red line, which is on the top screen, uh, this helps you. This helps clinicians or any researcher who wants to use this tool to view, the, to view the data at any particular arbitrary angle. And that could be someone sometimes very helpful for for the doctors when they want to view certain part of the brain from a certain angle. So that gives them this sort of a flexibility. And how many lines I wrote? Fourteen. <laughs> So yeah, that is the power of open source community. Somebody did a good work. If you read, if you can read the code, all you need is just to use it, and that's what we did. So this is us, uh, some doctor, my my team doctors, and me using this uh, tool all the time at work. So what we were able to do with this code was we were able to review 400 patients, each each patient having three different scans at three different time points we were able to review this data visually in a simple bash loop. And we recorded the response of our clinicians and helping them to review the data for the publications. Maybe I'm watching too much Netflix, but this is how you sometimes feel that when you did work in no time, you just think that you're a warrior and you can, you can use someone's code to get your job done. Anyway, let's go to the next challenge, which is the 4D data viewer. Yeah, now that was uh, for visualizing one single snapshot of the brain um, when we take a snapshot of the brain, it comes as 3D data for one single time point. But if we want to see the changes in time, we have to take several time points. And this is what you can see in this uh, video um, that represents blood flow. And you can see the arteries lighting up uh, in different points of time. We'll show you the viewer that helps us to visualize that more neatly. So here we have one single time point, and again we can scroll through the slices. We can also play with window leveling if we want. And this is the new feature. Now you can see the changes in time, and this is what I was talking about. Um, this is very useful for clinicians as they can see if um, blood is flowing or um, has some issues trying to reach certain areas of the brain. And for example, here they can see there's uh, less, less blood flow to the right area of the brain. Well, the good thing also is that uh, these tools could be fired from the SSH remotely, you know, and you can visualize all these data sets on, on all those sites which are far away from you, from your base center. And we don't need to bring the data back to our code lab and visualize and fix it. We can see over the SSH and, and deliver what we want to deliver. And they're also quick and responsive and 
easy to adapt with just a few lines of code, as Gagan mentioned. And um, well, this also um, sparked that our curiosity to keep um, tweaking some available Python tools. Um, in this case, it's, this is a 3D rendering tool that shows uh, the arteries. And uh, again, you can see how responsive it is. And um, in this example, there's um, an occlusion that doesn't allow blood to flow to this side of the brain uh, compared to the other side where you can see the vessels branching out. So when we say occlusion, it means the blockage, as you can see on this screen, that uh, uh, there, is, there is a blockage on one side. As Simon said, they were not fanning out properly, but the doctors can easily say that, okay, this is the point where the occlusion is. It's, it's still in the development, a lot of work to do, but it's fun. Now this is us playing with uh, basic uh, libraries and having fun developing quick tools, but now we have um, another software that was developed by, by a very talented uh, neuroscientist and programmer. Gagan will tell you about it. The next is the MRTrix 3. It is available, it's open source. You can download it at www.mrtrix.org. Uh, this was developed by my ex-colleague, Dr. Tunier, and his team. I think I'm not the right person to talk about this tool scientifically because it is such a rich tool, and I don't know much about it. But again, my focus is here Linux, and I can, I can take that liberty to talk about this tool. This tool, uh, the main function is to perform the advanced diffusion MRI analysis. And it's a cross-platform. It's available on other platforms also. I haven't asked Donald for that, but I guess his answer will be that on the other platforms, he made it available because sometimes it's difficult to change people, <laughs> but you still want to help them. So it's easy to change your code rather than changing those people. Uh, the design principles are, it's primarily written in C++. It's a multi-threading, it has a multi-threading throughout for performance. And also it, it's a very consistent user interface. If you go, you can have a look and it supports almost all range of imaging formats all of the popular ones. So this tool has many functionalities, as Gagan told you. But uh, the example we're about to show you has to do with creating and visualizing neural tracts in the brain. The image on the left side uh, shows a whole brain tractography. And uh, it can also be used with a seed and a target region, as you can see on the right-hand side. Now we will show you the potential to aid in clinical decision making. Here we have a tumor that um, is standing out in white and needs to be uh, removed. Surgeons want to know how much tumor they can take out without disrupting vital tracts. So uh, before going to surgery, they um, use Linux to uh, create a seed and a target region close to a motor area. And they, then they can have an indication of how close they can get to resecting as much of the, of the tumor as possible without compromising vital functions of the brain. Now coming back to the Linux, Amatrix is a collection of command line tools which we can use for batch processing in scripting or in any broad language of our own choice for programming. It's a great open source software. I think it's initially developed, uh, motivated by Linux, but now it's helping researchers and uh, also a clinical the clinical practice in all sort of spectrum. Now we will conclude with a few samples that show more insight into the image processing that we do. And we'll show you how open source technologies have helped us with specific needs. Oops, that's fine. Didn't expect PowerPoint to crash. <laughs> Maybe it's a lesson not to prepare presentations in this. Oh, here it is. That's fine. Let's take your time. We have the time. It's not a little bit further up. Yep, here. Go for it. All right, okay. we're back in the business. So sometimes our group needs to do something in imaging, and there's no software package available for that. And uh, we can develop uh, in-house applications which we write from scratch. And uh, this is an example of a quick tool for measuring tumor size and um, outputting different information that follows a complicated process. Um, 
we'll have to confess that uh, we were lazy this time. We developed it on MATLAB. The team was comfortable with that la language and we had um, time restrictions. However, we did use uh, Linux tools presented earlier to sort the data and structure the whole project. Sometimes we have non-negotiable solutions where we have to work with uh, sacred cow software. And by this we mean um, software that um, is limited to run on very specific operating systems. You can't change um, the way people run the software. So um, I guess the, the solution uh, Gagan suggested was to work with virtual machines. And I didn't know what that was. I've only heard uh, the myths that you can run Windows on a Linux box. Um, this is probably basic for you guys, but this was very exciting for me to give it a go. And um, I guess this is what we wanted to avoid, having the blue screen of death coming to you on our computer. And we found that by caging that Windows operating system in, inside a, an Ubuntu box, we were able to control if that, um, well, if the Windows side of it failed. And it also allowed us to run our cron jobs smoothly. We were used to um, running this on Linux operating systems with no problem. And again, we found that it's more stable than running it uh, natively on a machine. Uh, this is another example where, I, again, I feel like a superhero because I was able to deliver um, a result for um, uh, another project that needed scans to be delivered to a machine that ran only on a very old version of Windows X, yeah, on Windows XP. And we needed to automate it to uh, deliver um, images automatically. And um, the point here is we were able to um, create this virtual box in Ubuntu and then found that it was easily portable to other operating systems. And this is very useful when you need to impress uh, doctors that are very um, the fond of um, Apple technology. So still does the job. We would like to conclude uh, today by sharing a few lessons which we learned from the main aspects of our workflow as we discussed today. Uh, that was the data processing uh, using PyDICOM and DCMTK toolkit and also using our boutique software which Stanford has provided us, uh, data visualization, uh, data management. But uh, still there are times when we used to have, we have to use the other software packages uh, to support uh, the three very important aspects of our workflow. As we all know that it's not easy to change people, process and technology in a well uh, working atmosphere. Uh, there is a lot of stabilization, and it's not easy to change people. I'm pretty sure you would agree with me on that. But the good thing is that that uh, we feel that we are in exciting times where we can deliver anything we want to using Linux. And if you're very specific about your tools, uh, then Linux has all the power to glue it together, and it provides us with the infinite possibilities. The idea of coming here and presenting our work was twofold, to tell you that this is what we are doing and how Linux is helping us. But also to ask you the question that, do you think we are doing right or we are just doing very stupidly? And if you think there are better ways to do this thing, please come and talk to us. Uh, recently, I came, I mean, not recently, maybe a year or two years before, I came to know about this uh, neuro Debian distribution, which is the Debian-based distribution. As uh, There is a lot of tools which are available for neuroscience on this distribution. What is more exciting is that you're seeing that how the, these two sciences are converging together and they could be very helpful with the infinite possibilities in the coming time. Now, I uh, would like to emphasize that uh, our choice to use Linux at the core of our workflow was dictated mainly by its higher reliability and stability, which uh, oops, gives us uh, more freedom and control in our workflow with the added benefit of uh, reducing costs. And um, yeah, I mean, on the cost, I just want to add the point that sometimes when the cost is huge, your progress is sometimes slowed down. But luckily, we had the Linux, and it provided us with all those options, and we could focus on the delivery rather than the problem. It's, you know, other problems which were not necessary to focus on. Um, well, lastly, if bound with proprietary software, uh, you can always uh, use Linux to serve as a glue. 
And um, last, uh, we'd like to thank the open source community for developing all these tools that uh, help us to leverage it and develop some quick and excellent tools. By now, we have hopefully convinced you that uh, neuroscience is better with Linux. Along with the life with Linux. <laughs> uh, I would, uh, we would like to finish this by this uh, one of my favorite quote with Bren Benjamin Franklin. The time which we invested earlier in our career to learn Linux, of course, it was steep learning curve with, as the black window was very dangerous, you know, as we discussed. But <laughs> that's the truth. When you see first time that black window, it's really a magic. But the time we invested is now providing us with a lot of opportunities and possibilities to focus on the delivery. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. And thank you for your attention today. I know we've certainly got time for questions, if uh, anyone has any. Ooh, a lot of questions. All right. Do, yeah, it's on. do you have to work with any um, proprietary hardware or anything? And do you interface directly to that with Linux? Or are there yeah. intermediate things there? Well, do you want to answer or should I should answer? Uh, I'll say something quick. Okay. Uh, proprietary hardware, I guess the scanners are proprietary. Uh, but once the images are delivered to us, then we have the freedom to do whatever we want with Linux. That's the main benefit. Uh, we don't straight away work with that. As Simon says, scanner is proprietary. You don't know what's going on. It's a black magic behind that. And they will never tell you also. But on, in the same breath, you know, there are, I have seen some groups working with some sort of a proprietary conduits where the data goes in and being processed and then it comes out. But we don't have the straight away experience of using those sort of hardware. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. I uh, just wanted to ask, Based on your um, imaging, you had that 4D type imaging. Can you have the image running and then also move the location of where you're viewing that image in that software itself, or well, how did that work? Sorry, uh, you mean that you mean that when you are moving through the time? Yeah, can you move through the image as the time is running, so you can see how everything. The, the time is running as you're moving the image, is what I mean, as one. No, well, it's, if I understood correctly, yeah. once you have those snapshots, you select a particular location, and then you move the time-based you know, pointer yeah. to see that how the changes are occurring in that particular part of the brain. So the time isn't running as, you know, indefinitely. No, you're, no, it's you're just, just that sna snapshot is running. Yeah, that's a snapshot over the time. So because we have already taken those snapshots, yeah. and now we are just selecting a particular part of the brain, which is interesting for the, uh, for the clinical decision to the clinicians. So they say, oh, this part of the brain looks very interesting. Let's see how the contrast level is flowing in this part of the brain. And that gives them a fair amount of idea that uh, whether it's right or not and what sort of therapy to be used. Okay, thank is, you. Uh, they usually want to focus on a static uh, s slice, as you can see here. And once they get to that slice, they want to see what happens uh, throughout that slice. But we haven't had the need to move uh, both uh, vertical and horizontal sli um, slicers at the same time. So um, with Linux, um, who do you think uh, gave you the most pushback in trying to use it? The most pushback in in trying to you know use Linux, like so. The, so there were people who you know didn't really want you to use Linux. So can you talk about sort of the people who didn't want you to use it? No, no, people, people. Everyone re was really supportive of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was in nature and the nurture. Nature is with curious that okay, what's going on? But we were nurtured well by two couple of people, and I would like to mention Donald, Dr. Soren Christian. These are our mentors who helped us to get into this and treated us like a babies, you know, and taught us with small, small things together. And, you know, that is the beauty of when you work in the academic world. People are really supportive, so as the open source community. Have you had much uh, interest or done any collaboration with other brain centers in using the software? Is it, is it in use anywhere else? I think. 
Yes, uh, we collaborate almost, as I said, uh, with large number of hospitals and the uh, other centers. The software, which, we was, which is a boutique software for our stroke trials, is provided to us by the Stanford University. And Dr. Tunier is right now in King's College of London, but he used to work in Melbourne at Florin Neuroscience. So we were collaborating with him. He was, he's my ex-colleague. And there are a lot of centers. We, without collaboration, research can't go further. But sometimes there is a need when you have to develop your own solution because it's such a particular boutique need, you know? And that's where reinventing the wheel teach you a lot of new things also, and you start understanding that technology. Uh-uh, now I understand how it works. Uh, thanks for the talk. You were asking for suggestions, perhaps. Yes. Uh, one I do have is um, I got given an MRI of my brain once, and then someone said, why do you want that? You're not going to be able to view it. You're going to need this $10,000 software to view it. So the first thing I do is go to Google and ask open source software for viewing brain images. Um, and I've been using a piece of software called Image J, like yeah. Image with letter J. Oh, yeah. uh, and it, it seems to do a lot of the stuff that you do, but it become, I find the problem with a lot of software where there's amazing tools that help you solve a very specific problem and then inevitably someone will come along and ask for an addition, can it also do this and can it also do this and it be can, can become quite unmanageable as you expand that software. So um, using a prepackaged solution that someone else in the community has built is often a really good way to try and avoid that feature creep where you have to manage that complexity yourself. No. Yeah, so, well, we, we try to use uh, packages that are built for that. They do an excellent job when you have the ability to bring those images locally, but I guess these examples were for quickly accessing those images over SSH, and they just save the day, and also for learning, it's great. Oh, definitely. And uh, just to add to Simon's point, I mean, you know, the time is a very critical thing when there is a patient in the scanner, and there is a motion in the data, and you have to clean it, and doctors just want to view it as soon as possible. So you want something that works in no time, you know, that sort of a thing. And of course, um, as Simon said, it's great for learning also. This is a less serious question, but do you ever get creeped out when you zoom into people's brains and look around them like that? <laughs> <laughs> so I can answer that. Uh, I, I do creep out. I, I don't find it that scary. Um, I'm, I'm a bit faced when I see surgery and that kind of stuff. I, I was able to witness awake craniotomy once, and. You see when they resect parts of the brain while someone is awake, that, that can be a bit shocking. Uh, but uh, I guess when it's just seeing what's happening on this side of the screen, processing the images, um, no, it's uh, actually interesting. And I think uh, I personally also start treating the image as numbers in MATLAB or Python. So I think for me it's the numbers and I have to make sure that where there is no numbers or where are some numbers, where is the black, where is the void, and that sort of a thing. So try to think as a, as a scientist, not as a doctor because I'm not the clinician, you know. If I start going into that, I will start thinking too much and that will not make me to deliver what I want to deliver. Just, just hope we don't give you nightmares with uh, this scary animation. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned earlier in the talk about the system, you kind of made the assertion that it was very secure, and then you kind of talked about what seemed like a quite open port of the 4441 4, 4 and data magically flowing between sites, mm -hmm. and then also mentioned a way of effectively sounded like working around the security that infrastructure people had put in the email server to prevent you from sending emails to get around that. Um, can you talk a bit more about how the... Is there a conflict with the infrastructure guys to do things like this, or is there security concerns that you have? You want to talk? I um, just want to say, with, with the pushing of the images, that's uh, something that has to be done in a very specific way, because uh, DICOM images are very sensitive to that kind of protocols. Uh, but with um, getting around uh, the restrictions of uh, local IT, that's where some of these tools helped us, and Gagan can tell you more about it. The first of all is this, that we have the arrangement and agreement with them, and we don't touch any private information. So these JPEG images which go by the email are de-identified. Nobody knows to whom it belongs, but there are certain numbers which 
which belong, which we know that, and they are up to for our own trial. And no, these are just the way of mapping those numbers. So once we know that, okay, these images have not gone to the doctors, we, we got those to our base, and as we have the VPN connection to those sites using SSH, that's how we've saved the day on that very particular, uh, in that very particular situation. If there are no more questions, uh, I hope you'll all join me in uh, thanking Gargan and Simon. No problem. <laughs> we, we hope we have made some sense, and you, I, I hope you, you have liked this talk. But if you have more questions or you have some suggestions, please grab us anytime, and we'll be able to help. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of everyone here, Kelsey.